Hello everybody. Today we're going to be continuing our series looking at the life of Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet. And we're going to be looking at the story of how he confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and won an amazing victory. The story of Elijah is recounted in the book of First Kings. And the the first and second kings recounts the story of the kings of Israel and Judah as it passes through the generations. Now, kings are pragmatic people. Their job is to run the country, um, to uh, work for the benefit of the people so that their country runs well. But also, of course, they, they want to become more powerful, to become more influential, richer, all these kind of things. Now, the kings of Israel were no different to kings of any other country in that respect. There was many power hungry, greedy for money and influence kings uh, amongst them. But what made the kings of Israel different is that alongside them, they had these people called the prophets. And the prophet's job was to call back the kings and the country in general country of Israel in general I should say to the covenant relationship which God had established with them under Moses so every king would have a prophet in their ear saying no no you shouldn't make an alliance with that country because we rely on God to protect us say no 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 we shouldn't uh, go and worship that foreign God that supposedly brings sunshine or brings rain or brings whatever it might be because we have the God who created the heavens of the earth. We have a covenant relationship with him and he has commanded us to worship him alone. Now, some kings listened to the prophets that God gave them and, uh, and acted in accordance with the covenant and others did not. But one of the ones that definitely did not was the king that was around in Elijah's day. And that was King Ahab. And here's what the Bible says about King Ahab. It says Ahab did more evil than in the eyes of the Lord than any of the kings that came before him. He was the worst of kings. He paid no attention whatsoever to the covenant that Israel had made with God. And yet, while Israel at this time had the worst of kings, they also had the best of prophets. They had Elijah, who was courageously, continually called Ahab and the nation in general back to the worship of God. And it is encouraging that when times get really, really bad, when things look really, really dark, that the truth of God, the gospel, the covenants, they shine all the brighter. That was true in Elijah's day. And it's also true in our day. You may despair sometimes at the direction that society is going in. But the good news is that in days, dark days, the, the light of Jesus, the light of the gospel shines all the brighter. In Elijah's day, there was another major issue. Not only did they have this terrible king who ignored the covenant, but there was a famine in the land. However, these two things were not a coincidence. In fact, famine was a direct result of the unfaithfulness of the king of Israel and the direction that he led the people in. You see, when God made the covenant with, no, with Moses, he said, if you are faithful to the covenant, if you worship your God, one true God alone, then I will bless you. And he lists the number of ways which will bless them. But if you don't remain faithful to it, I will curse you. And one of the ways in, it says in Leviticus 26, it says, the sky above you will be like iron. The ground beneath you 
will be like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruit. It's talking about famine. And there was a famine in the land because the people had not been faithful to the covenant which God had given them. However, there was an answer. There was a way through it. Later on in that very same chapter, here's what God says, verse 40. If they confess their sins and the sins of their father, I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. And it goes on to say he will go back and bless the people just as he had originally promised. Elijah knew this and he wanted to call the people to repentance. But it was tough. You see, everybody was following this foreign god, Baal. Now, Baal, as uh, Dave spoke about last week, Baal was like the, the rain god or the storm god. People knew that they needed rain because there was a famine in the land. And so what do they do? Well, OK, we'll worship the rain god. Why not? Makes sense. That's the kind of thinking that a pragmatic king might come up with. But Elijah knew it wasn't right. God had called them to be faithful to, to Yahweh, to the, the God of Israel. And, and so he knew that he had to bring the people to repentance and to faith in him. And so he wanted to bring about a, a, a big, a massive confrontation between himself and the prophets of Baal. And so we're going to pick up the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, chapter 18, sorry, and verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire he is God. Then all the people said, what you said is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us. They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones... He built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. They did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, 
Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. So the people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in all the trench. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Wow. What a result. This amazing victory of Elijah's on Mount Carmel brought the people back to God. It so clearly showed that he was God and Baal was nothing but a worthless idol. And you know, when I read stories like this in the Bible, and not just that one, but other great victories of God, like when David defeated Goliath, when Moses parted the Red Sea, and other stories like that, I think to myself, why not today, Lord? Why not perform some mighty miracle? Show clearly that you are God and that the idols that we set up in today's society are nothing but that just worthless and not worth bothering with. But then I'm gonna think to myself, well, really when I look at the Bible, that's these great public victories, they're not God's usual way of acting. For sure, there are examples of them, but God's usual way is a little more discreet, a bit more subtle. It seems that he is performing for an audience of people who have eyes to see and ears to hear his working. It's doing miracles like providing a, a child to a barren woman. It's providing food for a starving widow. As we get into the life of Jesus, it's um, going discreetly to people's houses and praying for their sick. It's interesting that many times after Jesus performs an amazing miracle, he says to the person, don't tell anyone about this. It seems that God's priority is a little bit different to ours. We would want God to, um, to, to, to go all out right now to bring the victory home. God, it seems, is a little more interested in something else. And I think the answer is in the story that we just read. In verse 37, Elijah says this to the Lord. He's just about to perform this amazing miracle. He says, answer me, Lord, so that the people will know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back to you. You see, burning up some a bull on a hillside is not a problem for God. That's actually really easy for him. He can do that just as easily as you or I can strike a match. What God really wants is for people to turn to him in repentance and faith. God isn't looking for people who can do amazing miracles. God is looking for people who will be loyal to him when life gets tough, when it seems that following him is a foolish thing to do. People who, when uh, the tough gets going, will say, no, I'm still going to worship God, even when it seems that everything is going wrong all around us as you know we recently put a, a bid in on a building that that we wanted and in the build-up to this process i can i had a conversation with a non-christian friend of mine who knew about the what was happened with the land thorn and all these things he, he was he was kind of aware of it and and i said to her i'm going to show you that god is real because we're going to Put in a bid and we're going to get that bank and we're going to have that as our building and you will know when that happens that God is real 
Well, I had to go back to him the other day and when he asked me what had happened with the bank, I had to say, well, I'm, I'm afraid our bid was unsuccessful. We, we didn't get the bank. Now, he was a bit too polite to say it, but I think he was probably thinking to himself, so it seems that God isn't real. Now, if you follow that line of argument, then that is the inevitable conclusion. But, however, even when the going gets tough, even when things don't go right, we choose to still believe in God. And that's real faith. When we follow him, when things aren't going so well, when we don't get what we're praying for. If we got what we prayed for every time, it would be it would be easy to follow God. There wouldn't be a decision there at all, would there? But God is calling us to follow him even when we, we don't see all the answers, even when we don't always see it all work out just as we'd hoped. And that's what God was calling Israelites to all those years ago. And that's what he's calling us to today, to repent of our sin and to come back to him in faith and to follow him. One of the reasons that I'm uh, so convinced that God is still with us, despite the fact that our bid to buy the bank building was unsuccessful, is that for us, it was never about the building. It was just a tool that we believe that God could help us to perform that which he has called us to do, to be a blessing to the community in which he has placed us. And in the same way for Elijah, it was never about the burnt offering. It was always about helping the people turn back to God in repentance and faith. You see, God had made a promise way back in that passage in Leviticus 26. It says, when their hearts are humbled, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham and sure enough as the people humble their hearts turn back to the the Lord their God God does another miracle for the first time in three years he sends rain on the land the famine is over I said a little earlier that I wish that God would do something amazing to show everybody that he is real the truth is that he already has. When, when he raised Jesus from the dead, God performed the most amazing miracle, which allows us to put our trust in him and to make a covenant with people all over the world that he wants just made with this one nation. People like you and me can now come to God, re receive forgiveness of sins, and eternal life our job as believers in him is now to live loyally to God putting our trust in him continually even when things don't work out as we hope they will to tell people of the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ that he is alive and reigning today with God it's never really about these big victories that we think that he should do to show people that he's real it's always about believing in that greater miracle that jesus died for our sins and that now we can receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life i want to encourage you as believers in him put your trust in him again today make the decision to follow him in everything in all that you do and just as God blessed the land as they turned back to him surely God will continue to bless us as a church and as we follow the uh, the promises and the calling that which we he has given us